Yes. All right. Um, all welcome to the Forum on Robotics and Control Engineering. Force. My name is Tan Salusalan, and I am an assistant professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering of the University of South Florida. And here I am also the director of the Laboratory for Autonomy, Control, Information and Systems, or LACES. Um, with the support from my university, I am very proud today to host Dr. Kale Johansson from KTH, Royal Institute of Technology, to participate in our live seminar series on control systems through the force. Um, specifically, force is dedicated to provide uh, free, high quality outreach events and online seminars uh, to reach broader robotics and control engineering communities around the globe. And we periodically invite distinguished lecturers like Dr. Johansson to give talks on recent research results related to robotics and control engineering. Um, I am almost done, but let me mention a few words about the WebEx. During the presentation, we are all muted. So please ask questions after the presentation. Uh, you can ask questions in two ways. Uh, first way is uh, you can virtually raise your hand through WebEx or you can simply unmute yourself. But session is being uh, recorded to be posted to the FORCE website through YouTube. So if you do not wish to have voice included, you can use the chat box to ask questions. All right, again, I am very proud uh, today to have uh, Kale. So he is professor at the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at KTH, Royal Institute of Technology. He received Master of Science and PhD degrees from Lund University. He held visiting positions at UC Berkeley, Caltech, NTU, HAU, Institute of Advanced Studies, and NTNU. His research interests are in network control systems, cyber physical systems, and applications in transportation, energy, and automation. He is a member of the ICMP Control Systems Society Board of Governors, IFAC Executive Board and the European Control Association Council. He received several best paper awards and other distinctions from IEEE and ACM. He has been awarded Distinguished Professor with the Swedish Research Council and Wallenberg Scholar from the Knott and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. He has received the Future Research Leader Award from the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research and the Daniel Young Author Prize from IFAC. Finally, he is a fellow of the IEEE and the Royal uh, Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences, and he is an IEEE Distinguished Lecturer. So for all of you who are here live for the presentation of him, first, uh, Kale, I would like to thank you for your time and participating in our forum, and um, we are ready for your talks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tansel. Uh, Thanks for that very kind introduction. Uh, thanks also for for having me in this uh, in this seminar series in the force. Uh, I think it's a very uh, nice and interesting initiative that uh, I would very much like to see more of. Um, uh, welcome also everybody who who is out there uh, listening, and I hope that you will have uh, questions and comments uh, afterwards then. So what I decided to talk about here today is work that uh, has been going on in my group for uh, maybe 10 years or so on, uh, on transport systems. I call it cyber physical control of automated transport systems. So it covers a, a, a pretty broad um, area and I would like to start to acknowledge that uh, it, it's it's quite a few people who have either been in my group or I collaborate with over these years uh, on, on the research that I'm going to discuss. And of course, there are a number of different agencies that have support this. The problem we consider is a, is a fairly simple one, you can say, to start with. So uh, we have a country or we have a region, a continent, uh, over which uh, we are transporting goods. And if we look anywhere in the world, for instance, in Germany, as in this case, goods is mainly transported within the country over highways. And it go mainly between the major cities because that's where people live and that's where factories and, and so on are. So, so what I'm interested in here and I would like to discuss with you today is how can we do this process of transporting goods over this highway network in a more efficient way? 
So if we look about that problem, how it's solved today, we can look at and see that there are some characteristics of this problem, right? I mean, we solve this problem in society continuously. And we do that by having long haulage trucks, like the one you see on the picture at the bottom right here, right? In Europe, we have about 2 million of those. In the uh, in US, uh, a similar number. In China, as an example, you have a little bit more. Uh, it's, it's a big number, but it's not huge, right? Uh, what is interesting from a research viewpoint and from a control viewpoint is that the level of automation in these overall systems is fairly low today. So it's, it's a manual process. There is a driver involved who basically gets an assignment and then drives from point A to point B and delivering these goods. Other interesting aspects of this problem is that there is it's a fairly heterogeneous and large number of different fleet owners out there who are serving, uh, serving in these operations. So what are we after here? We are after an, an objective which we can formulate in words as I do here in the bottom of the slide. So basically we're interested in increasing automation to make this overall process being more automated. We also would like to save fuel, and we think that we can save fuel by having individual trucks here cooperate in a better way. And in particular, we're going to look into cooperation where we go in road trains or platoons, as it's sometimes called, as you see in the picture. What we are interested in is not a purely academic answer here. I don't want just to have a solution to, to a huge optimization problem, which I would not be able to implement in reality. I want to come up with a solution which we can use and we can implement. And you will see that in my talk here, I'm going to describe quite a lot of experiments that we have been doing and we are working with the track industry on, on, on this. So you can say that the solution we want to come up with should have a little intervention when it comes to the vehicle speed, the routes, timing, and so on, compared to where these trucks are moving today. So what can we say about, about this problem? Why are we interested in this problem? And why are we interested in this problem now? I mean, from a societal viewpoint, first of all, we know that this type of transport is polluting the world. So if we can make it a little bit more efficient, it can make a great impact on our climate and, and, and so on, right? Another interesting fact is this thing about efficiency. So these are figures by a, a Swedish truck manufacturer, Scania, that you see here down to the right. So notice that one quarter of all their transport with their vehicles runs empty. And the average load capacity is just above 50%. So for many other infrastructure systems we have in society, we would say that this is a lot of waste here. Uh, there are various reasons why these numbers are fairly, fairly bad, but there might be some possibility for improvement. And what you see down there in, in green, it actually indicates that instead of investing so much in society today on cars, on people transport, there are various economic reasons why we should spend more effort on the professional transport, the goods transport. Finally, let's look at the demands from the individual fleet owner perspective. So someone who owns a few trucks or, 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 or more, right? What does that company spend its resources and money on? And you can all see from this pie chart that there are two major costs live over the life cycle of a truck. So one third of the cost is basically fuel. Another third is the driver's salary. So we can see now from what I formulated on previous slide that targeting fuel and automation might be an interesting and, and very economically important aspect of this, this problem. So what is the technology around? Why are we studying this now? And I, I don't think for, for this audience here, I guess most of you are engineers, 
you know what's going on, right? We have completely new type of real-time traffic information available today. If we look at a modern truck, it is a, a, a quite sophisticated type of mobile computing sensor systems moving there, right? A truck today, you will have a camera on board, you have radars on board, you can communicate with other vehicles, with the infrastructure, you have basically a high-end PC computing capability on board and so on. So you can do a lot, a lot of interesting stuff. These new ways of uh, uh, propelling the vehicles forward. Today it's mainly diesel, also fossil fuel, but in the future there will be like electric and so on, but still we need to make it more efficient. Another technology that's been around for a while is this now a vehicle platooning and other types of automating the driving. And this is something we will talk much more uh, about here. But if we, if we just first look at the system that we have been developing, so let's look at a short movie. So say that we are back in Germany, we have four cities and we have two transport mission that is happening between these four cities. And let's say now that the transportation share a segment in time and space in the middle there. Then, of course, if we share that and we go there together, we could go in this type of road train, a platoon, right? If we know all the transport going on over Europe, we know the source and destination, we could coordinate this and try to maximize the amount of platooning. And platooning now in reality looks like what you see here. So here you see three of our Scania truck running now automatically in such a platoon, as I, as I talked about. You see that there are drivers in the driver's seat, but they are just there to monitor the operation, basically. So there is an automatic regulation of the distance between the vehicles. It's not only that we need to be able to control a platoon. We also need to be able to form platoon on the highway, right? So here you see that the last vehicle are joining two other vehicles to form such a platoon dynamically while they are driving. There are also other things that we'll, we have to be prepared with. Of course, there will be other vehicles driving on the highway like this human driven car now. And that human driven car decide, I want to sneak in here for some reason. Maybe that you want to leave the, the highway or, or, or so. Then as you just saw, the platoon automatically split and give space for that vehicle. When the human decide to leave the platoon again, the platoon then uh, reduce the distance uh, automatically and, 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 and so on. Of course, that could also be so that something is happening here on the road. So the first vehicle maybe needs to do an emergency braking. And in that case, all the vehicle needs to brake instantaneously. So this is now a system which is operating and is, is out there. It's not in production yet. There is no such system basically that you can, you can buy, but all major track manufacturers are working on this type of system. So basically the starting point from, for this talk is, let's say that we have such systems there. What would the future look like? So, and, and in, this is my poor uh, illustration of the future now. So you see that I foresee that we still will have uh, tracks around. They will go in platoon on the highways and they will form these platoons while they are driving around between harbors and cities and so on. If we have such a system, if we, we can operate such a system, we can basically think about the whole operation of transport of goods from the top level uh, fleet management and so the, the services of logistics, all the way down to individual vehicles. We can think about that as an integrated system, which with different layers that you see indicated here. So on the bottom layer, I call it operational level. Then we have the tactical, strategic, and service layer. We have vehicles on the bottom. Of course, we need to be able now to drive the vehicles in this type of platoon, as you saw that we already can do. But we, don't, we need furthermore to manage the platoons. So we need to be able to form platoons, split platoon, and so on, as you also saw. On top of that, we need to be able to coordinate platoons. What I mean with that is that 
when vehicles are out there driving on the highway, different destinations over different highways, we need to be able to try to map, match them together. So some vehicle maybe needs to go a little bit faster in order to merge with other vehicles to form a larger platoon and so on. And on the highest level, we need them to, to manage the system. Uh, to, for instance, manage it to the back office, as you see that to the bottom right here, you see some operators of such a system. So here today, I'm going to describe, so we are working uh, on developing this whole system, which is going to change the complete operation of this, this um, goods transport or freight uh, transport. And I'm going to describe uh, pieces of uh, problems on different layer in this system. We will start from the bottom. We will start talking about what it looks inside the vehicle, and then we are going to move upwards. And what I will describe is some solutions to problem that we have developed in our group here in Stockholm. But I will also give some indication of things which are not solved, problems which are interesting to consider for the future. And I can imagine that perhaps there are some PhD students or, or other students in the, in the audience here. And I think this area opens up with a lot of interesting open problems to consider and that needs to be solved for the future. But let's start from the bottom. Let's start with, uh, with the individual vehicle. Let's start with platoons. So vehicle in platoons is far from a new concept. As you see here, it's from a paper which is more than 50 years old by, by two giants in our field of control, uh, Professor Bill Levin and, and uh, Mike Athens. And they were thinking in the 60s about this, that if we could drive vehicle in a platoon, we could think about them as a string of uh, moving masses. And then one can reason about how to control that and so on. A lot, a lot of theory have been built around this type of concept. If we look from a practical viewpoint, one of the key results that were developed in, uh, in California, and for a long time this project was led by Professor Pravin Baraya from UC Berkeley. So they were thinking about at the time that we should drive more cars tightly together on the highway because then we can get basically more people being transported by these cars. So they thought about the vehicles integrated into the roadside system. And they made a fantastic demonstration in the late 90s on, in San Diego that you see a picture of here. Since then, a lot of other things have been, been done and, and so on. And now, what I will talk about here is this idea about doing platooning, not for cars, but for trucks. And we are very fortunate in Sweden that we have two truck manufacturers here, uh, Scania and Volvo. And we are co having collaboration with both of them on exactly this topic that I, I will uh, will talk about here. So why platoon with trucks? It's very different from why they were platooning with cars back in the 80s and 90s, because the reason why we platoon with trucks is illustrated in this picture um, here. So you see the color in this picture indicates the air pressure uh, that is, is uh, putting pressure on the, the two trucks here. And as you see in the picture, when we move the second truck closer to the first truck, the air pressure is reduced on the second truck. The consequence of that air pressure reduction uh, is that the air drag is being reduced then for the, for the second truck. If we now have in this plot the relative distance on the x-axis between the vehicle and the platoon, and then the air drag reduction on the y-axis. You see that for the second and third truck, if, if they are 10 or 20 meters behind the first vehicle, we have an air drag reduction about 40 to 50%. So such large air drag reduction gives us a fuel reduction, which is significant. It can be a fuel reduction for something like 5, 10, 20 percent. Depends now experiments and, 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 and so on, which literature you, you, you read. In our experiment we have done here, it's nominal, it's typically 10 percent. You can now think 10 percent fuel reduction for 
for a system that runs 24 seven and is consuming so much uh, energy. And so that the one third of the whole cost of running this operation is the fuel. Of course, it's important and it's very, very essential to, to consider what we, how we can put this technology together. But on the other hand, running a truck behind another truck just 10 meter or 20 meter behind, we need automation. We cannot ask a human being to manually operate a, a vehicle so close to another vehicle. So there needs to be, be automation. So let's discuss a little bit how that automation looks like. And before we discuss that, let's look at how the automation looks within a single vehicle. So a single truck that has a cruise controller that tries to optimize its uh, fuel uh, spending. So what does, does it mean? So here to the left, I have a single vehicle. If that is going on a flat road, the optimal thing is just to keep constant velocity. But if, if that vehicle is now is going uphill here and we have a road uh, uh, grade, which is alpha, then we can optimize the velocity of the uh, vehicle according to the road grade and according to the dynamics of the vehicle. So that problem is perfectly to formulate as an optimal control problem. So we can minimize the fuel consumption. So we write out a cost function, which corresponds to the fuel consumption. And then we use Newton to write out the dynamics of the vehicle. And you see that to the right hand side here of the Newton equation, we have the engine force, which is so to say acting to drive the engine, to drive the vehicle forward. But we have a number of forces that acts against us. And we have the, the air drag we talked about before, which typically depend as the velocity to the power of two or something like that. And then we also have the gravity. You see, so the, the gravity is acting against us. And of course, the gravity acting against us will depend on the road grade alpha. So now we can solve this optimal control problem over a horizon, say capital T, corresponding to maybe some kilometer or some mile ahead. If we solve that problem, we get solutions which looks like this. So in this case, the, the altitude, so the road hill is going up and is going down. And below, if we look at the heavy track here, we see that the optimal thing for the heavy track is to speed up a little bit before the hill and then slow down and, and so on. And then before going downhill, we slow down before the, 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 the downhill and then we speed up uh, while we are coasting and so on. So this is the optimal way to, to, to drive the trucks. In the, in the track we are working with here, we developed this technology quite some more than 10 years ago and this is implemented in, in production now. Uh, and what I would like to go next is that if we now have this type of intelligence for how we drive an individual track, how do you now put this together in a multiple track? How do we do it if we have, uh, uh, so to say, what does the system look like there? So before we go to the multiple track, let's look into the control system architecture inside a single track. So here I have listed the sensors to the left. They sit on a communication bus. They send information to controllers here in the middle. The controllers compute actuation command, which goes to the actuators here to the left. That's the structure of the controller. We are talking about now the cruise controllers. So notice now that independent of if we are looking at the standard cruise controller, an adaptive and more advanced cruise controller, or a platooning cruise controller, or collaborative adaptive cruise control, as it's sometimes called, they look they are acting here, so to say, as a piece of code inside the controller in the track in a, in a similar way. So we don't change the overall architecture of the system. We show, we change here, basically, the control algorithms. The, the, the person who now decide which controller I should run is the driver, and you see that there is a switch here. So the driver is always in command here of what type of cruise control that he or she wants to drive. 
Notice that it's not just the velocity that we need to set for the, uh, for the system here. Of course, we also need to automatically brake. So we have a brake management system we need to regulate and we need to set the gear. So there's a gear management system. But that is basically the, the controller, uh, uh, the control signals that we are, are setting here. So if we now run in this CACC mode, so we are running in a platooning mode, then we have a number of vehicles that goes together like, uh, like you have seen now a couple of times. How do they exchange information? So they exchange information in two ways. First of all, as you see here, the second vehicle gets some information directly from the first vehicle through its sensor. So the second vehicle have a radar which is measure the distance of the vehicle ahead. So it measures and get that information about the distance and the velocity. But the system is also supported by, with vehicle to vehicle communication. So you see there is a wireless communication network here where the vehicles are communicating information between each other. So this is how, how it works. So let's spend a little bit of time now thinking about how do we actually in reality control the distance between the vehicle? Because you saw that it was so important that this distance is small. But it's of course also very important that we don't run into each other. So how is this, this problem solved? And as I said earlier, this is an old control problem, typically solved with a distributed control strategy. One have to be careful because we can get instability in the system here, something called string instability, well, we have to deal with that. And there is a lot, a lot of work in this domain for those of you who are interested in, 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 in studying more. I, I won't go into the detail of the literature and discuss all the different versions. I would like to start showing experiments. So let's go back a few years to some a, a sequence of experiments we run over several weeks in Stockholm or outside Stockholm. You see, we are here in Northern Europe. We are at the highway west of Stockholm, 45 kilometer stretch. And we were going back and forth, back and forth there with this vehicle platoon, as you see in the picture here, with three trucks. You see the altitude here of the road. So it, it goes a little bit up and down, but nothing extreme. So here we run our system now. You see on the bottom left the type of distributed controller that we used. So just along the line of what I just described, so we have a vehicle controller for each vehicle, <clears throat> regulating the velocity of each vehicle, but then it communicates with the controller of the vehicle in the next, in the next vehicle, etc. right? Here in this plot now, what you see on the top plot is the altitude of a short segment of the whole road. So we are just looking over a few kilometers. You see that there is a, 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 a hilly road. So it goes up here, the hill, then it goes downhill, uphill, downhill, and so on, right? The second plot shows the speed. So the velocity of the first vehicles. So the first vehicle, the blue line here, you see that when we are going downhill, for instance, the second vehicle is speeding up. So these are heavy vehicles, right? So they gain speed when they are going downhill. When they're going uphill now, they lose speed and they might not be able to keep the nominal speed because they are so heavy. And then this repeats itself in the red line. The, below there, you see the distance between the vehicle. You see the torque generated by the two engines here, and you see the braking force. And what you can notice now when you study the second vehicle, the vehicle that is now supposed to follow the first vehicle on some constant distance. You can see here that it's not doing well, the controller that we have. You can notice that th this um, uh, segment that I have encircled, notice that uh, we are going downhill. The first vehicle, the blue, is, is coasting and it's increasing speed. But then what is the second vehicle doing? The speed of the second vehicle seems to be oscillating here. When it's oscillating like that, what happens? The distance to the vehicle in front is also oscillating. It's oscillating so much so that you see that the second vehicle even have to brake a few times while it's going downhill. 
So braking means now that we are losing energy in the second vehicle. We are burning energy, and that is very bad, right? We, because we want to go in platoon in order to save energy, but here we are, are losing energy. So when we saw that this was happening, of course, it doesn't happen always, this type of phenomena, but sometimes this type of thing happens. We start to ask ourselves, is this now due to that we have this hilly road? Or is it due to that we have a certain spacing policy which is not good or, or so? So we, we were thinking and we have been thinking about these questions and I'm going to show you some interpretation of what is going on here just to see how one can think about the regulation of the distances between the vehicle. And let's do that with a simple, very simple example first. So let's say that I have a single vehicle here. It goes on a flat road and then it starts going uphill. Let's say that this single vehicle wants to keep a constant velocity, but that vehicle will never know exactly where the uphill comes. So when the uphill comes, there will be a disturbance in the velocity for that vehicle. So if I now plot that velocity, you see what's going to happen is that we will keep that velocity until that disturbance is hissing up, and then the velocity drops, and then it's back again if we have a strong vehicle. So of course, that disturbance that happens now, we can plot that as we usually do over time. But we can also plot it over space, as I do to the right. And of course, it looks similar in both these pictures. Let's say now that I put a, uh, a platoon there and that the second and third vehicle try to regulate its distance to the vehicle ahead to keep it constant to D. So if you think about what is now happening when that disturbance hit the first vehicle, what will happen with the next vehicle if they are able to perfectly regulate the distance D to that vehicle ahead. Of course, that will mean that if a disturbance hit the first vehicle, the disturbance is going to propagate instantaneously to the other two vehicles. So if we plot that in a diagram, the, how the disturbance looks now for all the vehicle in this platoon, theoretically, it will look like to the left here. So all the vehicle, we have the same disturbance happening instantaneously. If we plot it in space instead, we will have the picture to the left. So the disturbance hit first the, the vehicle, which was here, right? But the second vehicle, it hits at this point in space, and so on. So think now that you propagate this picture forward, right? You animate the platoon forward. Of course, next now, the second vehicle is going to hit the same disturbance. And then the third vehicle is going to hit the same disturbance and so on. So you see that there, in this type of system, there might be a propagation of disturbances that is hitting us consequently, which gives us some problems. So this was the reason, this could be a consequence of regulating the distance. So let's think now about that we regulate something else. So we can regulate on something usually called the headway, which is this quantity, which depends on the velocity of the vehicle, then we get different uh, shapes of these this curves. We can also regulate on the time gap, so a delta t. So you can think about that if we have a suitable time gap, we can actually get completely the opposite picture of what we had previously. So we can make sure now that the disturbances in some sense are being synchronized to one point in, in, in space. What is very interesting if we regulate on such a time gap is the following, that if we now try to keep a time gap between each pair of vehicles, to keep that time gap is equivalent to say that each vehicle should have the same velocity at a certain point in space. So if a vehicle in this platoon have the same velocity as the previous vehicle in space, that gives a very nice separation of the control objective here because it suggests that we should not solve the control problem on a single layer, but it's kind of a two, it's a cascade control problem, right? So we can divide it into two things. So we should, we should make sure that every vehicle have the same reference in space as the other vehicle. 
And then every vehicle should try to regulate its time gap to the vehicle ahead. And if we draw this in a block diagram, we get something like this. So we have a reference that we should keep to the, uh, to, to the vehicle controller here, which, uh, and then locally we now keep the time gap to the vehicle, vehicle ahead. So, so this idea one can argue mathematically also while this is good and we have been developing a theory which extends the classical theory of string stability by the group of Professor Hedrick in Berkeley and many others work on. And for those of you who are familiar with, with this theory, you see that one can extend the concept of string stability to what we call here disturbance string stability that I'll capture this type of stabilities in, in such a system. One can now design controllers which are suitable to actually generate string stable uh, controllers in, in this precise sense. I won't have time here to go into the detail of this theory, but I just would give you some flavor of it. If anyone is interested, we of course have a number of, of, of papers um, Particular, this one is with Bart Betterlink in the TAC um, a couple of years ago. But it basically then suggests, as I said earlier, that we can separate the controller into the structure controller, and we can generate now a string stable system, and we can, for instance, regulate in each controller on a quantity, an error quantity, which I call small delta here. And small delta uh, include now both the, 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 the um, time gap to the vehicle ahead, capital delta, and the error with which we are able to keep this reference velocity. And what we can show is that if we regulate on this small delta in every vehicle, then if that is kept small now, for each vehicle locally, then the overall platoon would globally be stable in the sense that I'm, I'm talking about here. So let's go back now to our experiment and let's look at how, how this works. So now I've changed the, the uh, control architecture compared to what I showed you before, right? On the lower layer, it's, it's similar. We still have vehicle controllers there, right? But I introduced a platoon coordinator and I introduced a row database up here. So what is the major changes I have made? I have said that I assume that I know the road grade. This I assume that someone is giving me this, uh, a database or so, an intelligent map that provides me with this. And then I have this platoon coordinator, which now computes this common reference velocity for each of the vehicles. And if I now run the system over the same road segment as you saw previously, uh, it's not a, a real experiment in this case, it's very detailed hi-fi simulations. But in this case, you see that we have now velocities of the vehicle that change over space, just according to this principle I introduced. In particular, you see that when we plot this over space, they actually overlap perfectly. Of course, over time, they will be different. And thanks to this, now we are able to have a safe platooning. We are always away from this, uh, this minimum distance that we want to keep. And we are more fuel efficient than we would be in the previous, uh, pre previous case. Something which is very interesting now is to think about where should this platoon coordinator that I had here in the middle, where should that reside? So that is solving an optimization problem, finding what is the optimal reference velocity for the whole platoon. But where should that be? You can think about that should be in the leading vehicle, it should be in every vehicle, but it can also be in the infrastructure. So this makes something very interesting now when we think about infrastructure supported mobile systems. So we are working now on the idea of actually computing this, for instance, in the edge cloud. So you can think about it as being computed in the cellular system and that the vehicles are connected to the cellular system here. 
Of course, if we now do that, it creates a lot of interesting challenges from a control viewpoint. And let me mention one here. So if we are controlling a system and we are moving in the infrastructure, we are, are controlling it from a base station, as you see here, then we need to have a way to do a handover of this control code when it goes from this uh, computing unit in this base station to a new base station over here. And this, uh, some of you might know from communication that there is a, a something called a handover in regular communication that makes sure that we move with our mobile, regular mobile device from one location to another. We are our connectivity is handed over from one base station to another. In this case, we need to move now real-time computing code, namely the control code that is operating this platoon. And we have been developing this type of, uh, of code here. And what you see in the scheme to the right is how such an handover scheme can be implemented. And so, but this makes it also very interesting to look for, for what is happening in the future now, because we, right these days, 5G is being launched around in the world, and 5G provides much better possibility to do real-time control and setting up new connections quickly and do handover in a new way. It doesn't yet support what I'm talking about here, but we think that this could be very suitable for the future. To, to, to do this. And we are currently at KTH experimenting with that. So we are, are, are just a few months back in December, we launched a 5G test bed supported by, uh, by Ericsson, who is uh, a, a basically a seller system provider and the operator, Telia, that you see pictures of here. But we are trying now to build this uh, into our, both in the lab, as you see here, where we are running some toy cars, but also out with real automated vehicles that are connected over this 5G testbed, uh, testbed there. So let's move up now. That was a lot about what is happening on the platooning level, but we need to create platoons. So how are platoons being formed? And the principle there is very simple. So we say, as you see to the left here, that vehicles are coming now from different highways and they are merging and they have a, an, a segment where they might go together. And then they have different destinations that split at some point. And what we can do now is that from the infrastructure, we can control this merging. So what we do there is, as you see in this picture, that we need now to, to identify platoons or individual vehicles that would be benefiting from, from going together. And then we suggest optimal speed profiles for them to merge. And these optimal speed profiles are computing very similar to the optimal control problem I showed you uh, in the beginning of the talk. I don't repeat it here, but what I want to emphasize is that the control implementation now is a bit more challenging because basically we are closing the loop, as you see here, over the infrastructure. So in this case, we need information about the vehicles. We need information about the traffic around us. And then we compute what is good reference speeds for these platoons in order to, to merge like that. So how would such a system work in practice? So let's go back to experiments. Now it's, it's some experiments done a couple of years later. We are now doing, uh, we are back outside Stockholm. We have Stockholm up here to the right. We are a few um, miles or kilometers south of Stockholm. It's a short road segment here, right? It takes maybe just 10, 10 or 15 minutes to drive this black road segment. What you see in the movies to the right here we are sitting in the second truck. The second truck tried to merge in a platoon with the truck in front of us. And you see now that we, uh, it, it's in, in most of these videos, it's quite heavy traffic, so it's quite difficult to merge, right? But what we are interested in here is under what traffic condition is it possible to merge? Of course, the more traffic there are, it's more uh, difficult it is. 
In order to study this problem, we run a number of tests. So again, we were out here over several weeks, going back and forth, back and forth, 600 times. And then, of course, we bring we measure everything around the the tracks. But we also have an infrastructure here which gives us measurements. So you see the, this gate that we are passing through uh, now and then. They are regularly positioned around this highway. And what you can see is that we measure now the traffic flow and the, the, the speed in each lane. So there are three lanes in this particular case and we gather this information continuously over these, these uh, 600 test runs. If we get all this information, we can plot interesting things. We can use this data for interesting things. One thing that I plot here to the left here is now what is called the fundamental diagram in, in traffic theory. So the fundamental diagram shows how the traffic flow, so basically the velocity, how that traffic flow depends on the traffic density, which is on the x-axis. So what you would expect now is that you know, the derivative of this curve here is the velocity, and that is now uh, fairly constant, right, over a, a segment here to the left. But if the traffic density increases, you know, we can be all over in this, this plot. Of course, if there is a lot of vehicle around, the, the, the behavior will depend and be very complex, or there could be accidents and so on that generates this data. But we see that there are some regimes in this uh, here where we can pre perhaps predict the behavior. And this we have been doing. We have been looking into how to predict, for instance, the time it takes to merge. So over segments where, when we have light traffic, medium traffic, heavy traffic, we can estimate now the time it takes to merge. We can use this information to predict for individual vehicles if they will be able to merge or not, or how long time it will take to merge. So we can now find also optimal strategies for merging a platoon, even if there is some traffic. If there is heavy traffic, we probably should not run a platoon because it's too complex. But in, in light traffic, we could improve now by, by this. Something very interesting we discovered during our experiment you see here now in this video. Because sometimes there is a driver there that doesn't want to, to pass us. We call this the persistent driver phenomena. So you see that most drivers, most cars go faster than the trucks. They pass us to the left, but that driver sticks there. So this is very interesting, I think, in, for control engineers in general to deal with this. So basically, this persistent driver, you know, influence the, the, the capability or the operation of our system. And we need to better understand such behavior. Today, we don't have a solution to this, but we have an idea about how we can actually try to understand the decision that drivers are making and under what circumstances we could predict this and what circumstances we cannot. And it goes into different direction than most of this talk. It goes into more cognitive science and, 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 and so on. So let's now move further up and, and in the, towards the end of this talk, talk about a couple of other issues. So one is, imagine that we have a lot of platoons around out on the highway, as you see here. How is that going to influence highway traffic? And a very interesting thing to, to think about is what you see here into the, uh, in the middle of this plot. You see a highway with a lot of cars and a few platoons. The platoons are going slower, so the platoons are somehow blocking somehow the capacity or changing the capacity of the highway. So this, this capacity change of the highway, we can actually think about utilizing that. We can model the traffic flow and the influence of the platoons by using models that have been developed in the literature before. We can modify this model to take into account such platoons. What we can do more now is that imagine 
that you have a highway, a stretch of a highway in front of you. We have our platoon of uh, vehicles that we can control here. Then for each segment in front of us here, we have some density of traffic. And a, a more yellow means higher density. So we have, in this case, some traffic jam in front of us. Imagine, like you saw before in our experimental plot, that we can now measure the density in these segments with the infrastructure. That information we can now feed back to a controller which regulates the speed of this uh, basically moving bottleneck that we have here, this platoon. So if we do that, we get uh, simulations, as you see here. So you see on the x-axis, you see the, the length of the road. So we have distance there. On the y-axis, we have time. So you, and the color indicates congestion. The yellow thing means that we have high congestion. So you see that after 40 kilometer and 0.1 hour, we have high congestion building up on the highway. That congestion is propagated backwards in space, as you see here, as time goes on. In this figure, I can simulate a single platoon. And that is done with the red line here, right? So a single platoon is following in a constant velocity, and I move towards the yellow area. And then the speed will go down when we are in this congested area. And then I pass that and I continue. So this is a, a platoon now without any control. What we can do is that we can regulate this platoon. So we can let it go slower. If we let it go slower, you see what happens. So if we let it go slower, notice that the congested area is much smaller in the right plot compared to the left plot. So by letting that go slower, we let other vehicle now actually delay a little bit. They also go slower than they did previously. But the congested area is being reduced. And that have a number of benefits to reduce the congested area, as you can imagine. And we can, we can regulate it in this, this way. Let's talk a little bit about the top level now in the last couple of minutes, just to give you an idea about what we call the platoon matching problem. So the platoon matching problem was that we have a number of transport assignments here, vehicle going between different cities, and we want as much platooning as possible happening around the road. So how can we solve that optimization problem? It can be solved in a number of different ways. Here is one uh, of our proposals. So we can think about that we have some leaders like this blue vehicle, and we try to adjust the speed of the other vehicles so that they are forming platoons as they go along the road with that leader. So this one can reason in different ways of how that optimal speed adjustment should be made to, for this uh, optimization and so on. We can also implement this. And a few years ago, we implemented this on tracks that went from Stockholm down to, to Barcelona in a system where we coordinated vehicle and form platoon uh, like, like this. And this, this had an, a number of, of benefits. I think I will skip this, uh, this, uh, this slide uh, so we leave some time for, for questions. So let's come to the uh, conclusions here. So what I try to argue for um, today is a new type of control architecture where we integrate several layers in basically the logistic system that is, is uh, transporting goods on, on highways with platoon. I indicate a number of problems here on different layers, and I show some, some uh, solutions to some problems, but I also indicated some open problems that are currently under investigation. I show that it seems to be important to attenuate topography variations in this system. I also show that new cellular infrastructure that is being launched today seems to fit perfectly for making more 
control from the infrastructure of connected vehicles, not only for safety reasons, but also for performance optimization. There's a lot of interesting other work that we and others are doing. You can ask yourself, what should you optimize? I talked about from the beginning here, of optimizing the efficiency of the system, but there is maybe a social efficiency that we should think about. How can one reason about that, different economic models and, 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 and so on. As I want to stress here, it's not just our group working on this. Uh, there are many different academic groups. We are working through projects now with different traffic vendors. We are involved in a, in a big European project with all six tra track manufacturers in Europe who are all working together now. And what we try to do in this project called Ensemble is something we call multi-brand platooning, which is how can we actually platoon now together with uh, different vendors. So you don't just platoon with Scania trucks, with Scania trucks, but Scania with Volvo, with, with Mercedes and, 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 and so on. So with that, I would like to thank you so much for your attention. And, and I'm more than happy if it's possible to get some questions through the, the WebEx system here or, or so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kali. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so all right. So now um, we, will, we, we take questions uh, for Dr. Janssen. Um, again, you can do this in uh, two ways. Let me open the chat box. You can ask your questions through the chat box, um, and I can read uh, your question to uh, Dr. Johansson, or um, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand through WebEx, um, whatever. So, I, uh, Kale, let me ask you this question. This is very interesting work. I mean, also, I am familiar with your papers on this and um, like anyone else. And it, there is a huge experimental support. Like, is this support coming from European Union or like Sweden? This is a, a good, uh, a very good question, Tanso, which uh, it, it's good that you bring it up because I want to stress this that. Uh, you know, as I said, we have been working on this for, for quite a number of years, and we worked from the very beginning, we worked tightly with, uh, with this uh, Scania, this truck manufacturer. So mm -hmm. all the experiments that you have seen here, all these experiments have been done at test sites or, or uh, uh, you know, or on the, on the real highways with Scania engineers. So the, the students, the PhD students, either students who are employed by the company, we have this format in Sweden, that they can be employed by Scania or Volvo, or they sit here with, with uh, us and are employed. Their experiments, this huge campaign that I illustrate here, they have extra support then for having engineers helping them with implementing and, and executing these experiments. So, uh, and without that, just doing this in academia would not be possible because we have, we don't have these resources. We don't have all these uh, engineers uh, who can do the experiment. Or you can just imagine, like in these pictures, there is an experiment with five trucks. You need then five drivers. And, mm -hmm. and uh, even if our students who work with them typically have this driver license, running experiments with 600 test runs, right? It's a huge... Uh, it's a huge thing. So this is a very good point that you raised. So it's important here to be able to work together with industry to be able to, so to say, get things implemented. And so. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's amazing. So, I mean, uh, one question from, I will read it to you, from Alessandro Papadokos. Um, very interesting presentation. My question is related to the cellular infrastructure. Connectivity is needing, ne needed for preserving the correct functioning of the Peloton manager, what happens when connectivity is lost or when messages are lost? Also, have you considered security aspects related to this? Yeah, this, these are also very good questions. So the, the connectivity is an essential, uh, very essential point here to, to handle that. And notice the way I describe that architecture, which looks like you see it to the right in this picture, right? 
that the vehicle, what I call the vehicle controller, always reside within the vehicle. I would never, I would never take out the safety controller, the one that guarantees that the, the vehicle runs safely. That you wouldn't move, right? That is inside. That needs to be able to operate under different levels of information. And what I brought outside here was what I call the platoon coordinator. In this case, the platoon coordinator was optimizing the operation of the overall platoon. So the optimization there is optimizing performance without sacrificing safety. And that optimization runs over a, a, a longer time horizon. We are not talking about very long, but we can talk about tens of seconds or so. If I lost connectivity to that, that would just mean that it would not be optimal over the coming uh, coming uh, threat, right? So it would never sacrifice safety. When it comes to the uh, to the security, it's also a very important uh, uh, aspect. I, I I can say here in what the experiments you see here are running with the current communication technology. In Europe, it's typically 802.11p, which is a version of Wi-Fi for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, which is based on. This, is, this is, is OK, right, to do this type of experiment. But if we look into the future and a huge deployment in society of this, this uh, technology is not good enough, right? We know from the use we have with our computers and so on, right? that running control system and a secure control system and so on, just over Wi-Fi, is not sufficient. So there is a lot of work where one look into the security aspects on different layers of this system. And I think there are a couple of, of interesting things to remember here. One is, I think we will very much see a system we have multiple mode of operation, different type of radio interfaces here. So you can think about that maybe in the future we don't decide if we should run it over the cellular communication network or over Wi-Fi or over some other communication technology. I think that you will see a multitude of different uh, information being exchanged in this system. And the reason for that is that that type of redundancy also pre provide resilience to things that, to faults and other types of, of things that can happen. If there is an attack here, of course, if it's on a higher level, a cyber attack, we need to be able to, to secure the system from that. If it's on a lower layer jamming or so, we need to have a system that is able to understand that it's being jammed and that is now taking action. Maybe the platoon split at this case or, or so on. But both these questions that were raised, I think it's very essential to spend more time researching about. Thanks, Kale. So um, I will read two more last questions. Um, so one from Adam. Uh, I don't have the last name. Uh, thank you for your informative presentation. Have you considered ways to rotate the lead vehicle to further improve the efficiency of the platoon, similar to how birds rotate when flying in formation? Yeah, good. I mean, I, it seems like we we have a think think there is a thinking audience here because this is this is a good point. And actually, we have a few uh, we have a few paper exactly on this because if we look again down here in the in the this five vehicle platoon, you see. It's quite natural to think about, and we, we solve this problem. You can think about what is the optimal location of uh, each individual truck in the platoon, because the location will depend on the mass of the vehicle, the, the, the power of its engine, and so on. And one could compute that, and one can solve this, and this might change during the, uh, during the execution here of the system. There is one issue, right? While none of this work that we did has been implemented when it comes to the changing the order and so on, is that for a bird to change and replace the leader, or if you are biking to change the order of the bikes, it's much easier than if you think of that in this uh, picture down there. Think about that we want to rotate the order of this uh, five vehicle platoon. 
What will happen now with the highway? So you will basically block the, 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 the second lane, right, of the highway during this operation. And this will create a lot of issues for the rest of the traffic. Not only that you will reduce the capacity, there will be angry car, uh, car drivers and, and, and so on. So I think that actually when we talk about heavy vehicles, to rotate and do a lot of manipulation of them during operation is a challenge to do. So there, there comes other aspects in which have to be taken into account. Thanks, Kale. So uh, last question, actually two questions are the same. <clears throat> Minshu Wardran uh, is the ask a question similar to time delay and uh, Kung Bin. I don't have the last name. So both questions are related with time delay more or less. And uh, and they are like, what is the effect on, could you please comment on the effect of the time delay in communication among vehicles on the overall control performance of the platoons? The time delay here when you regulate a platoon is, is very important. In the, in the experiment like the one I showed you, let me repeat again that in the experiment I show here, we used Wi-Fi. The wi so, so basically each vehicle on its local CAN bus had a device which connected to a, a, a Wi-Fi uh, radio transmitter which communicated to, to the other vehicles. If you look at the delay now over the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, in that experiment, the delay is not very long. The main part of the delay in these cases actually comes from when you go from the radio interface down to the CAN bus and you communicate that to the device on the CAN bus that needs that information. And depending on the implementation there, that delay could vary quite a bit. And as we all know uh, from a control viewpoint, we have to be very careful that we don't introduce extra delay. And so I think that handling the delay, we don't probably want to have more than delays of uh, area uh, ranges of milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. If we get larger delay, which we can get if we are not careful in our implementation, we need to actually change the way we implement this. This is also a way, a reason why we are considering integrating with the cellular communication. Because if we do communication to a base station and back again, you can get a very short round trip time. And actually, the vehicle to vehicle communication or vehicle to infrastructure to vehicle communication, both are in the range of milliseconds. And that millisecond seems to be, you know, you can do a lot of. of nice control when the delay is of that level. If you have larger, magnitude larger delays, you might have to compensate that from the control viewpoint, and then it's a different type of, of problems one has to be very careful about. Thanks a lot, Kale. And again, uh, thanks for your time. And uh, this ends the uh, seminar. And can we say, you know, so if audience has more questions, can they email you directly? Absolutely. And I put on, on the last slide here on the bottom, I hope it shows on your screen. I have my homepage there. And of course, yes. uh, there is uh, my email. And, and uh, I'm more than happy if there is more questions. I also put on the bottom here a survey paper we wrote for the proceedings of IEEE. It gives a nice, if someone like this kind of an overview of the style of what I presented here, it gives directions to where one can find much more detail and so on. And, and thank you again, Tansel, for, for this organizing this. It, it was a great pleasure to, to be part of, of this uh, four seminar series. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Kale. It, it was a pleasure to have you as well. All right. Uh, thanks, Kale. Thanks, everyone. So we'll see you in the next seminar. OK. Thank you. Bye-bye.